We're going to go on to our next speaker, who is uh, Marcelo Medeiros, um, my friend over here. Um, I want to introduce, he is a journalist and works as an international correspondent for Brazilian TV network. Very interesting stuff. Raised in a Catholic family, Marcelo joined Spiritism in 2005. He is one of the directors of the TV production company, The Spiritist Way, and a practitioner at Inner Enlightenment Spiritist Society, otherwise known as, many of you know this, IESS, in New York City. Marcelo also provides assistance in the area of media communications for all the events at that center. So let's welcome Marcelo. Hi everyone, thank you so much, Dulce, uh, for uh, this invitation here. For me, it, uh, uh, I was very glad that you invited me to talk about suicide because as a journalist, it, it is a subject that is kind of forbidden for us to talk in my profession because even it's not openly said when I was in college and after uh, doing all the, these 15, 16 years I've been working as a journalist, Every time you try to talk about that, that is something the news rooms in the, the editors, our editors in chief, they always tell us not to talk about it because the idea that they have is that every time you talk about suicide, we write about suicide, more people can uh, have the idea to commit suicide. So even though many times I try to talk about that, even uh, to, to talk about uh, how important it is to, to, to spread this word like we're talking here to prevent suicide. It's like it's a very, very difficult subject for us to, to tell. And you can see you, we usually have on the news, for example, when it, it is someone very famous that commits suicide, as we have here in the headlines, Marilyn Monroe, uh, Robin Williams, or uh, when there is some famous case that, for example, that teenager over there that committed suicide in the school. So when those events that caught the attention of the society, they, that it's okay for us to talk. But in our daily basis, it is a very difficult subject. And if you see, uh, only in 2014, we had 42,773 people here in America that committed suicide. And if we just compare with terrorism, between 2001 and 2013, according to the US uh, State Department, we had 3,030 people who died because of terrorism here in the United States. So if you compare this number, I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk about terrorism. Yes, we should, we need. But we don't talk about suicide as much as we could. Just uh, giving this example of the last debates, of the pres presidential debates, we saw in every debate the candidates had to uh, answer some question about terrorism, but we never saw any of the candidates talking about suicide prevention. And it, it, is, a, 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 it is something very important that we should talk about to prevent so many deaths as we see here in our daily lives. And as I talk about being forbidden, it's not something that happened today. Since the 19th century, all the experts, all the people that work in the media, they already told uh, that there was this debate about talking or not talking about suicide in the news, if it could or could not prevent this death. But in the, this century, the 21st century, we have the WHO, the health, uh, the World Health Organization, they have a media guide uh, where they say that journalists should talk about suicide in an appropriate and accurate way. So at least today we can see that it's changing. And I think that a workshop like this that we are having today is very important for us to spread uh, those ideas about how we can prevent suicide. And just coming back to the 19th century, we have Emily Durkheim, who is a sociologist. He's considered the father of sociologists. And he wrote this book, Suicide Study in Sociology. In this book, he compares the, and he studied the rates of suicide in the Catholic Church and the Presbyterian Church. And it is actually the first time that suicide is seen 
like in a, how it is seen in the society and not only in the psychological way. Because before Durkheim, uh, suicide was only seen as something that we could study uh, individually and not in the society. And Durkheim said that, no, it is something that it is, it, it, we, can, we need to study why it happened in a social way. For example, we need to study the groups. They are more vulnerable. We need to study in some cultures, some countries. We have higher rates. So he wanted to know why that happened. So what he brings to us, he uh, classifies four types of suicide in this book. The first one is the anom anomic suicide. Uh, he gives this name for the suicides that happen during times of great stress or changes. One example we could say in 1929 when we have the Great Depression here in the United States, many people committed suicide because of that. They didn't know how to handle with those changes that happened in their life, in their uh, personal life, in their professional lives. The second one that we have is the fatalistic suicide. This one he tells uh, that occur while the life of the person is under very tight regulation. And he gives some examples. For example, uh, the slaves, the prisoners, they are in a very tight place, a very tight way of life. Then they commit suicide because they don't see any other way to escape from that. The third one is the altruistic suicide. This is very interesting, especially today, because uh, it is what he, he says. It is when we have someone who commits suicide because of a cause. They are in a group, and they have those ideas in that group, and they commit suicide because of that, that group. An example would be the suicide bombers. And we see it a lot in the Middle East today, those people that commit suicide because they think they're doing something good to their group, to their society. And the last one, that is the one that we are talking in this lecture more, is the egoistic suicide. Uh, this happens when the degree of social interaction is very low. That means when the, the person thinks that he or she is a loner, he is an outsider in their group, they don't feel they belong to a group, they feel they are excluded or rejected. So this fourth one is the one that we are talking, in the, I'm talking in this lecture because it is about the rejection. So it is important to see that since 19th century, we have been uh, studying, we have been seeing this kind of suicide that actually happens when people are rejected or so, suffering from exclusion. So rejection and suicide. Coming back to the World Health Organization, they say that the suicide rates are higher amongst vulnerable groups like refugees and migrants, indigenous people, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex persons, and prisoner. And we have this, uh, I'm talking specifically now about teenagers because we have this very important and very interesting uh, survey and research that was made by the Youth Risk Behavior Study here in the United States. They asked teenagers all around the United States if they had thought about committing suicide in the last 12 months. And the answer is nationwide, 9% of the teenagers said they had thought about committing suicide. But if you go a little closer to one group that is also uh, vulnerable and faces many prejudice just here in the country, like Hispanic female, it goes to 15% of them. They said they had thought about committing suicide in the last 12 months. And the higher rate was between the Native Americans. It was 16% of them, they said, they had this feeling of committing suicide. So we can see that the more vulnerable the group is, the higher the rates of suicide and the higher the thoughts about this they become. So now talking about a little bit about transgender, this is a very important topic because when you say about transgender, usually they can be rejected 
by society, they can be rejected by their family, and they can be rejected by themselves. It's very normal for us to uh, listen to some stories that they look to the mirror and they don't see them as they, they are actually seeing themselves. They, we have women who feel like they are men. We have little boys who wanted to be little girls and they don't accept the way they are. They see the society doesn't accept many times. So we have this study from the City University of New York. They interview 3,500 adults, transgenders adults from all 50 states. And they saw that the risk for attempting suicide is 3.5 times higher when they are rejected by their families. And when they say that rejected by their families, it can be uh, the father or the mother not accepting that, the spouse asking them to leave the house when they find out that how they feel about themselves. Many times their children are not, they, their children are prohibited from talking to them. So, and they say that the higher is the rejection, the higher is the chance that they will commit suicide. For example, when they are totally isolated from the family, when their siblings, when their parents stop talking to them, they usually they try to uh, take self-medication to overcome that suffering, but many times it just leads them to commit suicide. They can't handle that by themselves. So now I, I want to ask a question for all of us here. Does it hurt to be rejected, to feel that we are not included in a group, or in a society, in a family? Uh, it's normal for all of us. We face rejection all the time uh, since we are very young. So I wanted to each one of us to, to bring a memory of one time we were rejected, maybe the time it hurt the most, and just to, for us to feel how, to, to come back to our memory how it, it feels like. For example, I can share with you one of the, the stories that I have. When I was 13 years old, I, have been, I had been studying the same school since I was three years old. So all my friends were the same friends that I had since I was very young. And when I was 13, uh, things changed because it comes pervert puberty and each one of us were thinking differently and I, I started to feel that I was not being part of that group anymore uh, because I didn't like, for example, soccer, that in Brazil all of the boys they need to uh, like soccer to be included in the group. I didn't like it. They were all talking about dating, about sex and I was still a very, even though I was 13 years old, I didn't have the horm hormones and my body was still a body of a very young child, like, so I didn't have the same ideas as they had. So one day I went to school and my friends, they simply start, stopped, to, stopped talking to me. All of, of the boys in my classroom, they didn't talk to me anymore. They stopped inviting me to go to parties, to go out, to do anything with them. So it, it was really very difficult and it hurts. I remember even now when I remember that, even though it's been like 23 years, it hurts. Uh, it comes to my mind the same feelings that I had, not belonging to that place, not talking to anyone, staying by myself during the break time, doing all the ex exercise at gym and uh, at the classroom alone. It hurts, and it really hurts. According to the American Psychological Association, that is no different from this pain, from the pain of a physical injury, for example. So they, they have also the study from the University of California, they say that social rejection activates the same brain regions involved in physical pain. So anytime we face a rejection, we are actually feeling that pain, not only in our mind, but it's like if uh, we were like punched in the stomach, it, it does hurt. 
and many times we can take a long time to heal that wound that we have. And there is a very interesting study for uh, Purdue University. They did uh, this kind of study. They gave money. They divided in two groups uh, of people. To one of them, they were rejected and gave money to the people after the rejection. To the other, they didn't give the money. They wanted to see if giving, by giving money, they are suffering will be softer. But it, it doesn't. They had the same pain as the other groups. So there are no recompense that we can give that can make us feel less pain. But why does it happen? Why do we need so much to be included in a group? Why do we need to be in this society? Because we are human beings and we are meant to live in a society. The psychologists, they say that we have a need to belong just as we have a need for food and for water. So the same way that we need to drink every day to survive, we need to eat every day to survive, we need to be part of a group to survive because we need each other to grow. And the Spirit's book, they bring the same explanation. In the question 766, the Kardec asks, uh, it's uh, the part of the book, the first question of the chapter about uh, social law, and Kardec asks, is social law founded, founded in nature? And the spirits say that it is because God made human beings to live in a society. Because we need each other to, to learn, we need to help each other, we need to be helped by the others. So it is like a basic need that we have. But why do, so if we need to live in a society, it is that okay for us to have opposite feelings for if I like someone, if I don't like someone? Why do sometimes I am in a group that people don't like me? Why sometimes I don't like also people around me? And in the Spirit's book, Kardec also asks about this repulsion that sometimes we feel to, uh, to another person. And he said, what is behind this addictive repul repulsion? sometimes felt between individuals who are meeting for the first time? And they answer, they are antipathetic spirits who can sense each other's nature and recognize one another without ever exchanging rods. And in the question 390, they also say that this hostility may spring from a difference in their way of thinking. As we ascend, these differences are erased and their antipathy disappears. And the spirits, they say that it's not only something from the lower spirits. You don't need to feel that we are very down, in the, like a bad person, if we feel this antipathy by, from, uh, to someone. Because they say that even the spirits who are good, sometimes if they don't have the same ideas, the same likeness to the other, they will feel this antipathy. But as we evolve, it will disappear. So it is okay to feel this about other person, not to like the same things that the other like. We don't need to, to be all the same persons, to have the same ideas. But what is not okay is to reject or to isolate someone because of that. Because we need to respect that. And what I brought here now, uh, usually when we are rejected, it, it, the rejection never comes alone. We usually come with some insults, with bad words, and to make us feel down, to put us down. And we have this comic from the Peanuts, like we can see Lucy is talking, Snoopy just gave Lucy one of his novels for Lucy to read, and she says, I don't know, I guess I have mixed feelings about it. I don't know if it is terrible or awful. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's not just okay to say that I don't like this story, I think it could write better, to criticize, because when we, when we criticize, we can do it in a, in a way that we can give some examples and some ways for the other person to become better. We can give our opinion, saying what I think you should do, to, in my opinion, you should do this or that, but she's just saying it was terrible and awful, just putting Snoopy down. So, now we have this 
And Joana de Angelis in the book have believed Joana de Angelis, who is the spirit guide uh, of Divaldo Franco, the Brazilian medium. She tells for us in the book, Happy Life, don't let the insult someone hurls at you ruin your day. Certainly, these are people who don't like you and even hate you. But it, this is no surprise because you have the same feelings in regard to others. So she brings us two advice here. The first one, okay, if, if we are insulted by someone, you don't need to let that put us down. We need to overcome and to go ahead. But at the same time, how many times we are the one who are insulting others? We are the one who are isolating others. So we need also to put ourselves in the other's shoes, not to act to them the same way that we don't want them to act onto us. And she also says, there is uh, plenty of kind, notable people around you. So it's not right to waste time on those who constitute an exception on your path. Leave all the offenses on the floor or of forgetfulness in the direction of the love that awaits you. So, as she said, there, there are so many people around us, so many people in, in the world, like we are seven, eight billion people here on earth. We don't need to become attached to a small group of people if we don't feel that we belong to that group. We can move on, we can look for other people around us. And today we have, today is so easy because we have like social media, we have internet, the same way that we can use it to do our research, to look for some music, for some, mu uh, some movies. We can also look for some groups that we, we, be, we can feel we belong to on social media. We don't need to stay to a group just around us, physically around us. We can go further and find someone who shares the feelings that we have. Now, coming back to the insults, why do we believe in what people say about us? Why all the time that someone insults us, someone tells something to put us down, why do we have to believe in them? So I have here two images uh, from the movie The Life of Pi and Gravity. And what we see in the first one, we see this boat in the ocean, there's a tiger, and the other one we have Sandra Bullock there in space working on the, some kind of, I don't remember exactly the, 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 the scene from the movie, but she, 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 she is trying to fix one of the things that broke on the spaceship. We can see Earth there behind us, behind of her. But what do we see now? We see the reality behind the scenes. The, all the two images, they were shot in the studio. So what we see there is not what really happened. In the other case, we see all behind Sandra, Sandra Bullock was a white wall, and we have planet Earth. So if we see that, if we watch movies and we know that it is not reality, why do we have to believe in what people tell us? The same way that we are fooled when we watch a movie, when we watch TV, we are fooled when people tell us things that are not true. We just need to realize that. Not everything that people tell us is true. We just need to filter that. So, <laughs> and uh, the spirits also tell us if we, we have the choice to suffer well or to suffer badly. And here we have from the Gospel according to Spiritism. Everyone one on earth suffers, whether upon the throne or upon straw. But alas, few suffer well. Few understand that only trials that are born well can lead them to the kingdom of good. And also, blessed are those who have the opportunity to test their faith, perseverance, and submission to God's will for they will receive a hundred times the joy they lacked on earth, and after labor will come the repose. Just like Christine said in the previous lecture, we need to 
to see everything that happens to us as a chance, as an opportunity to grow. So even the rejection, the isolation, when we are excluded, go ahead, see that as uh, a reason for us to become better persons, to w keep walking. If I go back to that episode that happened to my life when I was 13, I had to, I, uh, in the end of that school year, I changed school, I had to go to a new one. I am a very shy person and I was even shy, more shy when I was a kid. So for me it was a challenge to go to a new school without knowing anybody there. I had to get new friends and it helped me a lot. For example, when I moved here to New York five years ago, I was moving to a place, to a city, to a new city, to a, a new country. I didn't know anybody here. I had to move here, to start my life here, to work here by myself. So I think if I hadn't had that uh, episode in my life when I was 13, maybe I, was, uh, I wouldn't have been so ready to do that change when I was 32 years old. Oh, just one moment. Here. And this is for, from the book's uh, search, and you, you will find it. We don't have the translation yet, but it is from Emmanuel and Andrea Luis. It is a chapter about accepting ourselves the way we are. They say, accept the difficulties because the teachings will allow us to acquire more experiences. To improve ourselves, we need to know ourselves and accept ourselves. And one of the examples they tell us is when we receive a very negative uh, feedback at work. For example, we don't need to take that in a, in a way that you put us down, but we can see that by uh, a way of us to try to improve ourselves, to become better in our work field. And we can also do that in many fields of our life. It's what the, uh, the Emmanuel said, is a constructive, uh, I'm sorry, it's, uh, yeah, constructive accept, acceptancy. So let's keep in our mind that we are not what others think about us, and many times not even what we, what we think about ourselves, but we are to, truly what we feel. Let's come back to that example of the transgender. If we have the boy that don't feel happy in his body, he thinks what the parents think about him. He, they think that he is their son. They, can't, they don't want to see him as their daughter, for example. And what do that boy think about himself? He also thinks that he needed to be a, a, a son, he needed to be a boy, because he, he sees himself, himself in the mirror as a boy. But what he truly feels about himself, if he feels that he's not a boy, if he feels that he is a girl, why, what is the problem about being that girl that he feels like being? So we need to ask ourselves that question, what we truly feel about ourselves and go after that. And we need to understand that we can live and have relationships respecting each other and also respecting our individuality and free will without being afraid of discrimination or isolation. And it, it is also like Jesus said, we can give the other cheek when we are hurt in one cheek. If we are hurt, we give love. That's the way for us to grow as well and to help others. We don't need to discriminate others or to hurt others just because we are hurt. We can give them the other face. And also Emmanuel brings this very beautiful message to us. Before the cloud of tears, when the incomprehension of others targets your feelings, remember that someone will always offer you understanding and comfort. Before the abandonment of the loved ones, when you needed their presence and security the most, think about the benefactor that never abandons you. And when you ask who will this person be that never forsakes you, let your ears hear the answer, that's Jesus. 
So, as the spirits always tell us, and they say in the spirits book, Jesus is our model, Jesus is our guide. So let's take his example. Jesus was one person who was very uh, rejected here on earth, and until today, many people don't follow his teachings, don't believe he ever was here with us one day. And in Isaiah uh, 50, 53, 3, he says that Jesus was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him on low esteem. We can see, ju just to say one, one example of Peter that denied Jesus three times. Peter was one of the closest friends of Jesus, one of his disciples, he denied Jesus. Jesus faced that, but do you think that Jesus stopped doing what he was meant to do here on earth because of that? No, he didn't. He kept on, he, uh, he forgave Peter, and Peter then became one of uh, his disciples who spread uh, Jesus' teachings uh, around them at that time. But you may ask me, okay, it must be easy for Jesus because Jesus is a perfect spirit. He's a very elevated spirit, and we are not. We are not close, even close to that. So that's why I brought one example. I had a chance to go to South Africa twice, and we saw in South Africa that people suffering during 46 years, the black people in South Africa, they suffered from apartheid. They weren't excluded by society just because they were black. And I had the chance to meet two people when I went there the last time in 2013. And I brought here just a short uh, insert of the interview that I had, of the talking that I had to them, just for us to see how they overcame and how they think today about all the things that they went through. That was the worst situation. It was more like, more, more, even more than please, to be present. Because you are not allowed to be who you are. You know, you were not allowed to touch white people. You know, you were not allowed to even uh, go into a bathroom and use a bathroom because it was written there, whites only. So there was never a bathroom that was written for blacks, you know. So you had to be pressed, and, and that's a torture. <laughs> If both of you decide to live together and hold hands and be allowed to be you, both of you, then we become better people and we can heal the world. So I think, yeah, I don't know if you could listen to the, the other one, but I think it is so beautiful. I couldn't uh, believe when I interviewed them and they 
told me that they loved the white people, they needed white people as the white people need them. So it, it's just like we, we, we saw, we, need, we live in a society, we need each other, so we don't need to stay. Like if we face rejection, if you feel we are isolated, we don't need to give that hate back to the other, we need to love, we need to go on, and knowing that we can use that to become better persons and to improve ourselves. But I think this message is, is so beautiful, that's why I wanted to bring it to finish this lecture. Thank you so much.